My magic potion alone. Telling him I'm sincere and that there's nothing too good for us. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, family. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the mental house with me, your host, Khadija. Today is going to be one of those days where this is going to have to be in parts because I will not do this story. This these video any justice if I don't take my time and um, really do it the way I want to. So I want y'all to bear with me. It's going to be in a few parts, but it's really important that um, we pay homage, and at least I pay homage, and to a lady, my godmother, by the name of Sylvia Bell White, and. Uh, well, as I go on with a story, a lot of y'all might have known her. Um, I just know that the early years of your life is what kind of forms your opinion about, you know, what life's about. You know, your neighborhood, your neighbors, your friends, even your frenemies. All those things help shape your opinion about what life is. And Sylvia Bell was a very integral part of my youth a very integral part of my existence and um, it's amazing to me as I sit back and realize just how many people have been a part of my journey I want to thank them humbly I appreciate them humbly um, many are not uh, household names but they paid the price and made the sacrifice and I pay homage to them for inspiring me and instigating the the and helping to contribute to the person that I am today. One of the main people that I want to give homage to is again Sylvia Bell White. Because um when I think about the neighborhood that we grew up in, um I grew up in a very stable neighborhood. Sylvia was my next door neighbor. Whereas if you go out my back door, that was her side door. So myself and the little deaf girl that lived next door to me on the other side, we used to go over Sylvia Bell's house all the time where she would summon us to take the puppies outside. and uh, She kind of helped fester and quelch my desire and my love for secular music because... At that time, I didn't know just how I was in the thrones of the R&B scene in Milwaukee back in the early 60s. I had no idea that the people that I was actually partying with and sitting down and eating the food and potato salad with was actually the pioneers to black radio in um, Milwaukee. So none of that mattered. What mattered to me is Sylvia always seemed so sad and I never knew why. She was a sweet lady, tall, regal, beautiful, but she just seemed sad. And when she would call me over, she would, uh, you know, baby, I want you to come over and take the puppies out. But I would have to make Sylvia smile. I would have to make her laugh. And that's what I remember the earliest about Sylvia. Um, and so as I got older... And knowing just what Sylvia had been through, I thought I'd share it with you guys. And this is, like I said, going to be done in a few parts because I really want to do her and her family and everybody justice that's associated with Sylvia Bell White because she was a lady and she was a courageous lady. And I love her with everything in me. 
the evening of February 2nd, 1958, I wasn't born yet. <laughs> Sylvia Bell White and her friend Stella were driving down Center Street in Milwaukee. The two women in their 20s had gone to pick up cake pans, punch bowl, and cups that Sylvia had left at her younger brother Dan's birthday party the night before. Now they were trying to hurry back to get to Sylvia's house so that she can get ready for her night shift at the nursing home. As they crossed 6th Street, flashing police lights caught Sylvia's eye. That looks like that's Dan's car down there, she remarked without stopping. Further down 6th Street, Daniel Bell lay dead in the snow, shot by police during a traffic stop. Unable to justify the killing, the shooter planted a knife on Dan's body. He and the officer with him had devised a cover-up story. Without notifying the family, the police department gave the officer's account to the media. Mama, they killed Dan. Sylvia was getting dressed for work when her son cried out this news. By the way, her son name was Douglas. And, wow, I don't know, I, Douglas may not be here anymore, but if he is and somebody tells you about this video, it's me, and I'm all grown up. And he was Douglas, and Douglas was her only child. Stunned, she struggled to make sense of the television newscast. One detail, though, rang false. The police said that Dan had jumped out of the car with an open knife in his right hand. Well, anyone close to Dan knew that he was left-handed. When she and her brothers, Lawrence and Patrick, raised that issue at the police station that night, they received only racial insults in response. Twelve days later, on Valentine's Day, an all-white inquest jury declared the killing a justifiable homicide. Sylvia lost more than a brother to this incident because she had always been more than a sister. You know, and a little sidebar, a lot of y'all that's from the South, y'all already know that the girl, the oldest girl is always called sister. Usually, I ain't gonna say always, it's usually called sister. And so the nickname, thus you have sissy, like sis, Sissy Houston. So I know they used to call her sissy too. I called her Miss Sylvia, okay? But I remember her brothers would call her Miss, I mean, Sissy. More than that fun-loving little girl who braved playing in the Louisiana swamps with the boys. More than the beautiful young woman that the Bell brothers could be proud to dance with at the nightclubs. The cool jazz blues enthusiasts who married Milwaukee's first black DJ, O.C. White. The only girl of 13 children, Sylvia has showed the responsibility at an early age for mothering her siblings. Later, when the younger ones came north, she and the older brothers acted as parents. Now the shooting of Daniel would destroy two additional lives. Okay, and that's Jimmy. <sighs> wow. And well, it was Lawrence, wasn't it? Um, Jimmy. I'm sorry. <sighs> I'm sorry, you guys. Just give me a minute. And Ernest, the two closest to Dan, went to identify the body. The trauma did irreparable psychological damage to both of the men. A wrongful death lawsuit filed in 1960 only brought the Bills greater sorrow. Their father collapsed in the courtroom and never regained his health. He died a broken man, crushed by what seemed a cruel irony. He had raised all 13 of his children in the deep south. 
you know, and I'm sick of people saying that black men do not love and support their children. That's another myth that we really have to stop saying because I don't know those kind of men. I really don't. These are the kind of men that I grew up seeing and knowing. He raised his 13 children in a deep south state notorious for violent racism. Yet Dan had been killed up north. Where his father had sent his children as if he had sent them to the promised land. They called him Doc Bell. And so Doc lived his last years in inconsolable grief. Just before dying, he predicted that what had really happened that night will one day come to light. Remarkably, it did. Twenty years after the death of Daniel Bell, one of the officers involved, Lewis Krause, decided to reveal how the killing had occurred. Hearing Krause's narrative, Milwaukee District Attorney E. Michael McCann, as y'all remember him, he was the one that prosecuted Jeffrey Dahmer, and assistant DA Thomas Schneider decided not to listen to this. They decided not to reopen the case unless they could get the shooter, Thomas Grady, to confirm the allegations. Krause had incredible Krause, they said, had credibility problems. When the story broke a year later, the Milwaukee Sentinel headline his Ten convictions for offenses such as check fraud in an article that cast him as an opportunist alcoholic. Which most police officers are anyway. So why would that make him any less credible than the rest of the al alcoholics, cocaine using, and pill popping police officers? Especially here in Milwaukee. By then, however, the DA had wiretap tapes of Grady confirming much of Krause's account. Further collaboration came from an unimpeachable witness. Former Milwaukee police detective Russell Vorpagel. Vorpagel had always felt that justice had not been done in the Daniel Bell case. And I want y'all to remember these guys, all these players, besides the people I know, the Bells, are white. So consciousness bothers you if you got any kind of rational thinking uh, antennas about yourself your conscience it'll bother you and I made a deal with my conscience as Johnny Taylor said if my conscience don't bother me I sure won't bother my conscience y'all remember that well By then the DA had wiretaps, okay? And again, disturbed by his own involvement, this guy had consulted his pastor in 1958, requested a transfer, and then left Milwaukee for a career with the FBI. When the Bell case reopened, he revealed aspects of the cover-up that Krauss and Grady we're still trying to hide. Grady said on the tape phone that telling the truth will cause problems for everyone way down the line. So I want you to see this culture of police abuse that has dated back from the slave patrollers. So it, it will never be fixed because this is what oil and this is how the machine gets oil. You can only depend on righteous people who's conscious at some point some of them don't even never have it some of them go to, to the death with this heaviness on their heart but then you also have a lot of deathbed confessions from white people who have created all types of problems for black folk Especially if they've been in positions of power, which brings out the extreme narcissism in them all. You notice that <coughs> most of these narcissistic type get these positions of power so they can abuse people. 
Hundreds and hundreds of people was going to be in that soup, he said. In court, he claimed that this referred only to family and friends. Krauss gave contradicting testimony about his superior's involvement. Vorpagel implicated three higher ranking detectives, a former, a former chief of police and district attorney. Equally important, his testimony helped expose an underlying culture of racism. Sound any different than today, y'all? I mean, really. Does it sound any different than today? <coughs> Things can't change if you're using the same tactics. <coughs> it doesn't work that way. Excuse me. Daniel Bell's family had mixed emotions about the reopen case. A Milwaukee Sentinel article entitled Confession Ends Families 21 Years of Pain made it clear that no such closure had occurred. Patrick Bell told the interviewer that some of his brothers would not even attend. They would they they you know they could they would not even attend the um you know trial. Okay. Wow. Crazy. Mm. He said because they wanted to get as far away from the memory of the incident as possible. Lawrence spoke of family formerly always together on things until the pain of the death of Dan. It tore us apart. It just tore us apart. Sylvia angrily recalled the courtroom bullying her of her late father. By the time Grady confessed, Jimmy Bell had spent 20 years institutionalized for mental illness too severe to permit any statement. Ernest lived in and out of institutions. His 1980 deposition alternated between moments of lucidity, of lucidity and fantastic ramblings about the killing. Other siblings struggled with depression and nightmares. Remember, it was 13 of them. The toll had already taken temper their expectations as they filed a civil rights lawsuit. During the family's deposition, Patrick was asked whether he would feel any better if he learned that the killing wasn't accidental. I never feel right about that. I never feel right about the killing of my brother, he declared. Never. Rough handling of the unhealed wounds came with the new possibility of vindication. The courtroom media did not, um, battle did not end. Even after a jury agreed in December 1981 that a racially motivated conspiracy had violated the civil rights of Daniel Bell and his family. Unwilling to pay the $1,795,000 awarded, the city officials appealed and repeatedly refused the family offers to settle for smaller sums. Y'all hear that? Unwilling to pay the $1,795,000 awarded, city officials appealed and repeatedly refused the family's offers to settle for smaller sums. In an editorial for the Milwaukee Journal, city attorney James Brennan accused the Bells of treating Daniel's death as a legal gold mine. He got a bitch. To be exploited for maximum profit. Listen to these devils. Few heard the deposition where Lawrence Bell answered such a question of his family's motivation. We want justice when we come in here, he said. You understand? If you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, you're right. We don't want no more than anybody else wants. Cutting remarks 
proliferated as local politicians used public discussion for the case to score points with constituents. Sylvia and her brothers felt particularly stung to hear their family stereotyped as welfare dependent in the media buzz following the county's demand for reimbursement Ooh, of any eventual settlement. Other than what the county paid for the institutionalization of Jimmy and Ernest, the Bells made very ex extremely limited use of welfare. They preserved through hurtful experiences of racial discrimination. So I want y'all to hear this. And I think it's very important that as individuals, some of y'all don't have a clue to the price that we have paid for liberation. All of us don't have to get shot. Some of us, they wore down spiritually. Some people have been worn down spiritually. Sylvia was one of them. And I love you, Sylvia. They preserved through hurtful experiences of racial discrimination, found jobs, and stayed working. Eddie had put in 25 years at American Motors. Patrick, 31 years at um, on um, he was 31 years at A.L. Smith, and Lawrence had 20 years at A.L. Smith. And so, if y'all don't know, A.L. Smith was one of the biggest factories made car frames. They made it was that was one of the, I mean, one of the most valuable, viable found factories in Milwaukee. We had American Motors and we had A.L. Smith, Alice Chalmers. Um, anyway, let me keep going. My brothers and I have worked, Sylvia said. Tears coming into a county board meeting. We have paid taxes. After nearly three years, the city finally made serious settlement offers. But only in the last hours before the federal appeals court ruled. Now the Bell family with Sylvia in the lead. You hear that? I'm sorry, you guys. Let me just, just give me a minute. Okay. <clears throat> wow. Trying to get this right here. Okay. Um, bear with me a minute, y'all. Oh boy. Sylvia and Lee, they chose to await the verdict. Okay? Because after nearly three years, the city finally made serious settlement offers, but only in the last hours before the federal appeals court had ruled. Now the Bell family, with Sylvia in the lead, chose to just wait the verdict. In September 1984, the U.S. Court of Appeals in Chicago ruled largely in their favor. Favor, excuse me. The award of 1.6 million was twice that amount the Bells had offered to settle for earlier. Approximately 1 million remained under attorney's fees. Milwaukee County received more than 70000 in reimbursement. That's not a lot of money, considering it was 13 of them. And, but then they want to give the impression that all of them is on welfare. And I, I remember Sylvia being a nurse. I, I thought she was a nurse. She always had on her white, her white shoes, her white stockings, her white dress. She was always so clean. Had the prettiest teeth I've ever seen. They were just big and white and smiled and her smile was so radiant when she did smile. Wow. 
The rest did not go far when divided by 12. Sylvia used most of her portion to restore the family homestead in Louisiana. To her, the real compensation lay in winning a measure of justice. The Daniel Bell case matters to history because it exposes abuses that African Americans have all too commonly endured in a society that proclaims its commitments to equality before the law. What happened to Dan and his family exemplifies the experiences behind divergent black-white views of race and policy and policing. Rarely does police testimony so clearly show that minority communities have reason to mis mistrust the law enforcement system. The Milwaukee in Milwaukee, the Daniel Bell case re-enters public discussion with each new questionable incident. Historically, the case also holds interest because the unusually long period between Dan's death and the final deposition falls across key decades of civil rights, activism, and changing attitudes. <coughs> The years since have shown the rarity and thus heightened the importance in the history of civil rights law. The Bell's victory was legal. In another frame of reference, the Daniel Bell case has significance because Sylvia's involvement stimulated her desire to tell the kind of life story that history seldom has occasion to record. From outside, the privileged sectors of society becomes a woman's story, an African American story, a descendant of slave story, or as Sylvia would prefer, just a plain old American story. What so proudly we hail, answered Sylvia when I wished her and especially happy 4th of July in 2009. I phoned thinking about the first African American president of the United States. Her response seemed to sweep past the historical moment to a larger picture of a nation whose words promising freedom, equal justice, and brotherhood many African Americans have made deeply their own despite a history that has often contradicted those ideas. Sylvia's poetic leap to the national anthem came straight from the heart, she told me later. Of course, she intended specifically to hail the presidency of Barack Obama. The morning after the election, she told me she stayed up all night watching TV trying to take it all in. Keenly aware that the history she lived through had everything to do with the emotions she felt. Sylvia's autobiography, autobiography does indeed wind through much history. I'm going to stop it right there because I'm getting a little emotional and I'll be back for part two.